Thank you for joining us. I'm historian Edna Friedberg. As we mark Sexual Assault Awareness Month, today we will share an aspect of Holocaust history you may not know. In the decades after the war, some survivors and eyewitnesses relived personal traumas to create an early record of how perpetrators used sexual violence to terrorize, control, and dehumanize Jewish people. Stigma, shame, and the need to heal and move on led others to keep these painful events secret. It's only more recently that sexual crimes have become part of the wider understanding of Holocaust history. And today, we hope to lift the voices of those who bravely shared their experiences. Viewers, please know that our program will include firsthand accounts of sexual violence. And I caution you that some of this content is very difficult to hear. I'd like to welcome back to the program, my colleague and friend, museum historian, Lindsay McNeil. Hi, Lindsay. Hi, Edna. Thanks for so, thanks so much for having me. Couldn't think of anyone better to be here. I know that you and I share a passion for telling and teaching about these lesser known stories. So let's begin with the experiences of a Jewish girl from Poland named Dora Goldstein. So Dora, who you can see here in a post-war photograph, had survived two ghettos and several concentration camps. In 1944, she and her mother were imprisoned in Stutthof concentration camp, where they witnessed a horrific scene. Several women had escaped from the camp, despite the fact that Stutthof was guarded by SS guards and surrounded by an electrified barbed wire fence. After this daring escape, the guards decided to retaliate against the women and girls who remained imprisoned in the camp. And at the time, Dora, if I'm remembering correctly, she was only 12 years old. And decades later, she described in her own words, this terrible scene. Let's listen. We were punished uh, 12 hours naked in cold weather. And the additional punishment was, um, they took out four or five, and I don't remember how many women, and in front of all that, of the women that we stood in a row, you know, they raped in a rape that I have never read or seen it, not in a movie and not on the television. And uh, my mother was near me and uh, she took her hand and put it on, on my eyes. It's really excruciating to try to picture Dora's mother trying to cover her daughter's eyes, trying to protect whatever innocence remained for Dora after so many years of, of chaos and violence. Yes, and in fact, Dora goes on to say that the guards saw what her mother was trying to do, trying to shield her, and they pulled her out of line and beat her for this, knocking out several of her teeth. Basically forcing the other prisoners to watch was part of the terror. Horrible, unimaginable. Um, viewers, I'd like to invite you to pose questions for Lindsay in the comment section. And in fact, Lindsay, we have one viewer question already. Um, a woman named Mary is asking, what was the end result of these types of rapes if uh, the woman became pregnant? Could you speak to that? Yeah, well, that's a really important question. Um, sometimes people were killed immediately after they were raped, so it didn't really end up mattering there. But in other cases, we do know that women became pregnant. And there's actually a remarkable story of a doctor in Auschwitz named Dr. Gisela Perl who performed life-saving abortions on pregnant women, basically knowing that pregnant women would be killed, sent to the gas chambers, uh, had no chance of survival. So um, in some cases, women were killed immediately. In some cases, they were killed when their pregnancy was discovered. Uh, but we do know that there were doctors, midwives, people like Dr. Gisela Pearl, who did what they could to try to help women who had become pregnant. And to know that for them, pregnancy, just the, the state of pregnancy would be considered a terminal condition. Absolutely. I want to return briefly to Dora's interview to note something really interesting. Um, Dora actually first raises what happened at Stutthof, this mass rape that she witnesses, as a bit of an aside. She says, she's talking about how people didn't want to hear about what happened to her or her trauma. And she says something like, you, no one wants to hear about the mass rape that you witnessed. And then she goes on, continues talking about something else. But the woman interviewing her, the female scholar, didn't just let it go. She actually decided to come back and specifically ask Dora 
to say more. And that's how we have this testimony, because the interviewee listened to what Dora was saying, and Dora was willing to share this testimony. And when was that interview conducted? It was actually conducted in 1989. So the timing of this is even more extraordinary, because this was really when stories about sexual assault were just starting to become part of the conversation for scholars and for Holocaust survivors. So this was a really extraordinary moment. And I know, I'm sure you've had this experience, Lindsay, when you're watching an oral testimony from years ago and you wish the interviewer would pursue this theme or that theme. I think in some cases, as Dora described, people were uncomfortable to hear about this aspect of what was done to them or done around them. And in other cases, the interviewer may have felt that it was too intimate or too painful a topic. And that if the interviewee, if the survivor seemed hesitant, they, they should leave it alone. So. Um, you know, there's this personal interaction. Um, and of course, this is not unique to the Holocaust. What Dora is describing happened during the Holocaust. But we know all too well that in times of chaos, uh, war, or genocide, attackers often exploit the vulnerability of others. And this type of domination frequently takes the form of sexual violence. In the decades since the Holocaust, and even today, if we read the paper, sexual assault has proven a horribly consistent feature in conflict zones. And we have an audience comment that speaks to this. Bob writes in to say, I have always thought that if a group of people were given complete power and control over another, this brutality and more would inevitably happen. It wasn't just the Germans who embraced the Nazi ideology who did this. People around the world have also proven capable, proven that they are also capable of this. And so with our audience, um, this is a particularly painful and resonant topic. And we recognize that this program may bring other conflicts to mind or evoke memories of personal trauma. And Lindsay and I and our colleagues here at the Holocaust Museum, as an institution dedicated to the memory of the Holocaust, we hope to bring to light the often ignored voices of those survived who survived sexual violence in this era. Now, Lindsay, Violence against Jews during the Holocaust took many forms and occurred in many different settings. Can you tell us how the Germans and their collaborators used sexual assault as part of their brutality in many, many places that they invaded and occupied? As you said, Edna, violence against Jews took many forms and was widespread. One pretty well-documented example that we have took place during an anti-Jewish riot in the city of Lvov, which today is Ukraine. After the Germans occupied the city, they basically incited violence against Jews. We know that members of Ukrainian nationalist militias and Ukrainian civilians attacked Jews in the streets. They stripped women in the streets and sexually assaulted them. Here you can see several photographs from the Lvov pogrom. This was a spontaneous, chaotic eruption of sexual humiliation. Scholars estimate that between 2,000 and 5,000 Jews were killed in these attacks. And this pogrom is just one example of sexual violence during the Holocaust. So a case where it's not necessarily part of some specific plan, mm -hmm. but um, people lean in to the, yes. to the leeway and the power and the domination and hatred to humiliate and violate any way they can. Um, not in that tone, but in a nicer tone, we would like to pause for a minute to welcome viewers who are watching from around the country. Hello to you in Pleasant Ridge, Illinois, Carolina Beach, North Carolina, Nashville, Tennessee, Gilbert, Arizona, and Boston, Massachusetts. And also thank you to our international viewers joining us from the countries of the Netherlands, Denmark, Malta, and also Hull in England and Halifax, Canada. We are so glad you are here. Um, so the scenes you were just describing, Lindsay, were, as you said, um, in many ways encouraged, but also spontaneous. Can you explain how sexual violence also came to be a feature in many um, ordered mass shooting operations? So the Nazis and their allies and their local collaborators committed mass shooting operations of Jews throughout German-occupied Eastern Europe. And one part of this process was that they would typically require the Jews to stripped down to take off their clothing. Here you can see a photograph of women who have been forced to remove their clothing prior to a massacre. These articles of clothing were then stolen. They were sold at auction or shipped back to Germany. 
This was part of the widespread theft that is part of the Holocaust. But then you have naked or nearly naked women who were often sexually assaulted by the perpetrators prior to their murder. In this photograph, you can see women stripped down to their underwear in a mass shooting operation at German-occupied Latvia. And I will never forget one of the most searing testimonies that I've ever heard is the interview of a man named Leon. Uh, he was a teenage boy at the time of the war and he witnessed rape as a prelude to a mass shooting in his hometown in Aishashuk, Lithuania. Leon describes how he watched from afar as his teenage cousin, Sarah, was gang raped and then shot into a mass grave along with the other Jewish women and children of the town. And looking back, Leon remembered thinking that the assault was so violent, so cruel, that he thought that being shot was a relief for his cousin. Uh, a viewer named Deborah writes in along these lines and she says, the perpetrators don't see their mothers, sisters, daughters in the faces of their victims because they see their victims as less than human and it is heart-wrenching. Um, so in this case, we, it is unusual that we could have Leon put a name and a face and a personality to the woman being attacked. And later we will describe how it is not only women, and in fact, part of the humiliation process at many of these massacres was that um, mixed sex groups, men and women, would often be forced to strip together. And so it was degrading and embarrassing for them. Now, during the Holocaust, the perpetrators of sexual violence were often those we might expect, uh, the Germans and their collaborators, but there were also people who were not in uniform, not in an official role, and who played into a kind of power imbalance across Europe that frequently put Jews and other targeted people at risk. Many perpetrators were opportunistic, and at times they exploited the vulnerability of Jews who were in mortal danger. I'd like us to bring this down to the personal level and not just talk about categories. Lindsay, could you tell us about a man who broke his promise to help a Jewish girl who was sheltering in his home? So Serafina Strasser's father, Max, knew that it was only a matter of time before they were forced out of their home and into a ghetto. Serafina's mother, Clara, who you can see here in a family portrait, and her older sister, Pola, on the far right, had already been rounded up during a deportation. In desperation for some sort of safety net, Max decided that he was going to let a newlywed Ukrainian couple move into the home, take all of the family's belongings, on the condition that they would help Serafina if she ever needed it. Months later, Serafina had managed to escape from the ghetto and was desperately trying to find a place to hide when she remembered this promise. She returned to her former home and sought safety. Decades later, Serafina described what happened next. Let's watch. I found myself going to the house, to our house. This man, my father said, would help me, you know, and I, I came to the house and his wife was very, very sweet. They were newly married, she was very pretty and uh, she was delousing me. I had these long braids full of loud lies and she was like, very, very nice to me. And then she told me she was going to visit her mother and she was going to visit her sister. In the meantime, I was left with this man and he was fondling me. And I, I really didn't even know what he was doing until it started to hurt terribly and I started crying. And he says to me, if you're going to tell your father, I'm going to kill him and you. And he says, and if you don't like it, just leave and don't ever come back here again. And I did. That's when I ran away, and I never came to our house again. I, was, I never told my father because I was thought he would kill him. I'm picturing Serafina. She's a young teen, I think, at the time, returning to her home, a place where she once felt safe with her family. And when her rescuer raped her, uh, he must have also robbed her of the sense of security that home should convey. We cannot know whether Serafina would have eventually confided in her father about the attack because he later died in the Mauthausen concentration camp, but she was terrified into silence. Serafina's testimony is so difficult to listen to. And I think it's because of what you brought up, Enna, that this was in her home and this was a man that she trusted to help care for her, to protect her. 
I want to talk again about testimony here and interviewing. And one of the things that's really interesting to me are the words that Serafina chose to use when describing this. She's actually describing her assault in, in relatively vague terms. It's only much later in the interview that she uses the word rape. And this is really important because it wasn't uncommon. This was this is a very typical thing that you see in interviews with survivors. That they're using somewhat vague language or coded language that they um, maybe aren't comfortable being more explicit about what happened to them or, um, you know, they're waiting to see sort of a reaction from the people that they're speaking with. And sometimes we know that some survivors even initially spoke about assaults that happened to them in the third person, basically initially describing it as though it had happened to someone else. And I think here you can really see how much trauma sexual violence brought and also how difficult a topic it was even in decades after the Holocaust for people to talk about. So even the very language and the way a person talks about it shows some kind of distancing, or as you said, kind of testing the waters. Is there a willingness to hear about this yeah. element? Um, but this had reverberations for Serafina throughout her life. Could you please tell us and, and share with our viewers how she was unexpectedly confronted again with this traumatic experience many, many years later? So Serafina survived the Holocaust and immigrated to the United States a few years after the war. Here you can see a post-war photograph of her. Uh, in the 1990s, she returned to her hometown with another with a group of survivors, basically as part as an effort as part of an effort to memorialize the Jewish victims of the Holocaust there. And while she was in town, she wanted to see her old home. So she tried to figure out where it was and eventually does locate it. But the first time she's standing outside that house, she was so overwhelmed that she essentially ran away. But she went back the next day and she met a very unexpected face. Someone familiar came out of the house. Um, let's listen to Serafina again, describe what happened next. This old man came out, you see him in the picture, and he ran over to me and he kissed me and hugged me and cried bitter tears. And he's the man who my father gave the key to the house, and he's the man who raped me. And I saw this man, and I, I just freaked out. I couldn't believe it, but there he was. He's an old man now. He's uh, like 88 years old, he told me. And he kept asking me my forgiveness. He told me he had no meant no harm, and, and he says he cannot die unless I forgive him. When I first heard Serafina's account and I saw this photograph, I was shocked and I really had a hard time processing it that all these years later, she sort of ends up posing for a picture with this man who had raped her, as you said, Edna, when she was just about 12 or 13. Her composure is just extraordinary to stand there and pose for that photo um, with the man who embraced her, certainly a complicated figure in his life. He did rape her. He also gave her shelter in a moment that may have been life-saving. Um, you know, we don't know what's in her head, but she did talk about it. And for that, we are grateful and also to her family for allowing us to share this testimony today. Lindsay, I had mentioned earlier, hinted earlier, that it wasn't only women and girls who were sexually attacked during the Holocaust. And we do have a question to that effect. Jane is asking, were men raped? And the answer is, Jane, yes, unfortunately, of course. Uh, they also were subject to sexual offenses. Let's turn to a Jewish boy uh, named Abraham Mala. Abraham was only nine years old at the time during the war and had already survived a ghetto and several forced labor camps when his family was deported to the Auschwitz camp complex. There, Abraham was abused by someone who, again, at first appeared to be showing him kindness. What happened to this little boy? So Abraham describes how a capo, which is the term for a prisoner who supervises other prisoners on a work detail, took what initially appeared to be kind of a maternal interest in him. She brought Abraham food. Uh, she even gave him a toy, which is really extraordinary in Auschwitz. Uh, but it was only a little later that Abraham learned that her kindness might have cloaked other motivations. Abraham describes an incident with that capo, and I really want to warn you that it is highly disturbing. In Auschwitz itself, an incident that um, only many years later, 
I could comprehend what uh, was happening to me when uh, the same uh, couple had uh, brought me one day to uh, her barracks and uh, during the daytime when everybody was out to work she had uh, commandeered a, uh, a young attractive woman to wash me up and uh, talking nicely to me that it's important to be clean and uh, that girl uh, carefully washed me and fondled me and uh, then uh, that couple took me uh, on her bunk and uh, tried to arouse me and uh, as a nine-year-old boy uh, lying beside her on top of her and in any kind of position, whatever uh, she tried, uh, must have been futile. futile. But um, that was the life in the camp for this poor woman. The uh, degrad uh, degradation that uh, they put uh, people to, uh, to a point that uh, living was not worth living. doesn't matter how many times I listen to that testimony. It, it brings tears to my eyes every time, maybe as a mother of sons and just listening to Abraham's capacity to try to empathize and understand what might have brought these women to abuse him, the circumstances they were in. It's, it's just, it leaves me without words. We have now heard from several survivors and witnesses who bravely shared these traumas but we'd like to take a moment to also recognize the unknown, the unheard survivors of sexual violence during the Holocaust, those who chose to never speak publicly or maybe never chose to speak to anyone about their abuse and to acknowledge that of course, this is a totally legitimate and for many people a healing choice to make. Uh, I wanna ask you uh, along those lines, thinking about some of the, the stigma or shame that people felt. Lindsay, were female victims ostracized after the war? We have seen this happen in other cases of rape in wartime. I think they were certainly afraid that they might be, that it might be difficult, um, an obstacle for future relationships. I think we also see survivors, both men and women, worried about how their families will react, how the interviewer might react, that this, especially in the 20th century, but even today into the 21st, that sexual violence can feel like an unspeakable crime. And of course, survivors were dealing with stigma and shame and blaming themselves for the abuse. But of course, we know that it was never the victim's fault. A member of our audience named Esther writes in, we had talked earlier about what Dora saw in Stutthof, the concentration camp, and Esther writes, my mother was in Stutthof. She refused to talk about it. She dictated part of her story to a journalist at a displaced persons camp right after the war, but telling her stories was unbearable for her, and I understood. Uh, there were other survivors who kept quiet for years and years and years, and only later felt either able or suddenly uh, compelled to speak about it. Let's meet one such survivor. Lindsay, please introduce us to a man named Nate Leipziger and help us to understand what prompted him to speak about his personal experience with sexual violence many, many years after the fact. So Nate was a Jewish teenager who had survived a ghetto in several labor camps, including Auschwitz. Nate and his father were imprisoned in labor camps, um, seven different labor camps. In fact, here you can see a photograph of them. And in one of these camps, Nate was sexually abused by a male capo. Nate survived the Holocaust and immigrated to Canada after the war. And it took years for it to come to terms with what had happened to him. He says he blamed himself, that he felt ashamed to talk about it. We know that he gave multiple interviews in Canada uh, talking about his experiences during the Holocaust in which he did not bring up these sexual assaults. And that it wasn't until the 2010s, when he was a much older man, that Nate decided to discuss what had happened to him. He says that he was inspired by hearing other survivors of sexual assault come forward and tell their stories. 
especially people who had survived sexual abuse in residential schools for Indigenous children in Canada. In 2018, he spoke to students alongside a man named Eugene Erkan, a sexual abuse survivor from one of these residential schools. Let's hear Nate describe how Eugene helped him to share his story publicly. On my 80th year of my birth, I had to deal with certain aspects of my experience. And at that time in 19, in 20, uh, 2010, by that time, the secrets of the residential schools were coming out. And I saw people like Eugene standing up and saying, you know what? I was sexually attacked. I was sexually harassed. I was physically harassed. And that gave me an impetus to reveal my story and to be able to finally put it on paper as to what happened to me as a young boy in a concentration camp of 15 years old and how I was attacked and how I was raped by other prisoners. And that gave me courage to reveal what happened, just like Eugene finally found courage to come out and say what happened to him. There's a, a profound beauty in seeing those two men together, seeing that they no longer needed to carry shame and also how Eugene inspired Nate, that once one person speaks, another may feel that they can too. Lindsay, I want you to know that the stories we're telling today are resonating with our viewers. Ellen writes in to say, this is such an important and timely subject. Thank you, Ellen. And Jane writes to say, thank you for this program. I work as an advocate for survivors of childhood sexual abuse and rape. We need these stories to be told. And we hope, Jane, that uh, not only the testimony, but also the resilience of the Holocaust survivors that we are sharing with you today uh, will come through and prove inspirational for the young people that you are assisting today. Lindsay, before we close, I'd like to give you a chance to speak personally from your heart about why you feel these stories are so critical. These accounts are so critical to teach and to publicize, even though they are difficult to listen to. I mean, first and foremost, I think it's so important to honor the bravery of those survivors, including Dora and Serafina and Abraham and Nate and so many others who have chosen to share these stories, to give interviews, to talk to student groups about what happened to them. Second, I, I really think that talking about sexual violence during the Holocaust helps us to better understand the Holocaust. Sometimes when we're talking about the Holocaust, we're talking really at the big picture. But these stories of sexual assault and sexual violence kind of force us to confront the extreme dehumanization, brutality, and really the intimacy of violence during the Holocaust. And finally, for me, it's so important to acknowledge that in recent decades, it's been mostly female historians and scholars who have worked to bring these stories to light. Alongside those who chose to tell their stories, it's these scholars who deserve so much of the credit for bringing this to our attention, for making this a topic that is part of how we understand the Holocaust, and then expanding the conversation to make sure that we're including men and boys who were sexually assaulted as well. Basically, it shows us that representation uh, matters in ensuring that a full history is told. Well, I wanna thank you very much, Lindsay. I know that I personally learned a lot uh, in preparing for this program, and I know that it will resonate with many, many people watching around the world. So thank you, Lindsay. Thanks, thanks so much for having me. As historians who are dedicated to deeply understanding the Holocaust, this history and all of its complexity, even the parts that are incredibly painful to examine, we owe a debt of gratitude to those who endured pain and trauma and yet somehow mustered the, the strength to speak about it. Their willingness to share their accounts removes some of the power of those who sought to dehumanize them and uh, return some sense of agency to people all over the world who do not wanna be defined by what was done to them, but instead by who they are. So thank you for that. Thank you to our audience for joining us today.
Be well, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.